So, uh, Fearless Leader, what are we doing here today? Well, we're going to be talking about a couple things on that, but... Is there a conventional merge with you? Technically, it's written because I have to Fair enough. <laughs> but, you can't start a good show without uh, your theme music. Oh, we have theme music. I'll listen to our podcast. All right, thanks everybody for showing up today. Scorpio online. And what we have going on right now is the Gaming Theater Podcast. The Gaming Theater was originally a channel that I ran for, and I still run, on YouTube, which does various different Harry plays and Let's Plays and a couple of other videos on there. But there was a history section in there, and now we sort of branched out into a podcast to allow us to talk about different things that we wanted to talk about but either didn't have time for or didn't really fit the motif of the YouTube channel. And that's what we're going to be doing here today. So with this case, we explore our different notions of games, game design, mythology, history, storytelling, tropes, and various other things that sort of, sort of pop up from the discussions within the group of game theory. So today's subject, we're going to talk about the influence of uh, the class system for Dungeons and Dragons. Now, to help me out with this explanation, we're going to introduce a couple of our guests right now. And just give us your name real quick. Uh, my name is Dane. Uh, I am a professional historian with Boise State University and have been playing D&D since I was eight. Uh, so coming up on 30 years. My name is also Dane, just to make that confusing. Um, I am a bachelor's degree history holder myself and I have played D&D since I can remember. And my name is Leo Garcia and I'm the host of Game Theater Presents. Although I do not have a formal degree, I do have a background in game archaeology. Now, that being said, though, I have also been playing Dungeons and Dragons off and on since about, well, I'd say, 94, 95. Um, now, the reason why I'm talking about this subject today is because it is no short feat to say that every single video game RPG has been influenced one way or another by Dungeons and Dragons. This goes all the way back to the original RPG, one of the oldest ones, Ultima, and even some like Final Fantasy. They have fully credited themselves as being inspired by or delivered by um, Dungeons and Dragons. Now, why that's important to us is that class system has gotten into the zeitgeist and has explained itself for its motif from multiple video games, tabletop RPG games, um, cinema, and storytelling in general for it. And this is sort of where we're going to explore. We're going to go over some of the classes on it and then sort of pop into a couple of things that let you know why they're doing this. So, I figure, to start off, we should start from the beginning, right guys? Yeah. So, to give you the origins of this, Dungeons and Dragons originally started back in the early 70s, 74, in 1974. But before that, Gary Gagax, the guy who invented Dungeons and Dragons, was working on a project called the Chainmail. Chainmail, for those who don't know, is a uh, tactical strategy game played between two people. Exploring through that, he just sort of created, a, on a third edition, he created a third entity. So normally you have one person who's fighting against another person. They had set up a third entity, which is a third person, kind of like a referee, but also could do other things. Barter, trade, mercenaries, and various other things that affected the game. So many people liked that, that he hopped onto, uh, that he decided to make a companion for that, which is the, what we know as the original Dungeons and Dragons. After hearing a couple of the little talks in the and this is the 70s, so you hear by word of mouth that other people are speak, are to work up to get um, the RPG system going for this. And he quickly signed up and created TSR. And that's where we hit about why he's gotten to, he basically called first when he came to tabletop RPGs. And that's sort of the, the, the ending of why most people are inspired by his work. First, called it a day. Now, with, uh, with the first edition of Dungeons and Dragons, it came with Chainmail as a base board for it because this is early 7th identity, so the amount of tabletop RPGs at all is non existent. They had other polyhedral dice also almost non existent. So they were all, they would have a box of Chainmail, and then you also have with it Dungeons and Dragons. 
Now, the Dungeons & Dragons class system back then is extremely simple. There's only three. The first one is the fighting man. He a man. He fight. He does two things. Um, the second one is a spellcaster. Well, we haven't even labeled these as wizards or druids or things that we know of right now. It's just, you cast spells, that's your guy. And the third guy class is a cleric, a little pirate. Can fight, but not as good as a fighter. Can cast spells, but not as good as the spellcaster. Now, if this sounds familiar because to this, many games follow this. Probably the world's, one of the world's biggest games, um, League of Legends, follows this sort of method. You have your frontline fighters, your backline, your backline power users, and you have your medics, your support. So that's where they sort of evolved into. Now, first edition had, let's call it a bunch of quirks with it. The biggest issue with that is, if your class is, and your stats were matching for it, you could almost not pick a class because of it. You want to be a spellcaster, but you rank, but you rolled a low number in intelligence. You just can't. The rule state you cannot have. And that's where things get kind of wonky. And this gets carried over for a while. When you're building your character the first time, you have to roll for your stats first, then see if you can even pick the class that you want to be. And it was in order, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yeah, so that was the thing. It's in order. So first, you pick your, uh, you roll for your character. You roll for your stats, then you pick your character, your class. And back then. Races were just considered another uh, that they had back then for elves and dwarves. Were just considered another class, but they either elves, wizards, uh, so therefore they're magic users, or dwarves, and therefore they're fighters. So that's sort of the thing. It's very limiting on what you can and can't do on that one, and they and that's sort of how the like guys looked before that. And you have to also get a giant box about this big. Because, or is not only do you need Dungeons and Dragons, you also still need Chainmail because all the parts are there. Yeah, I was reading a book recently, uh, Art and Arcana, which is a visual history of Dungeons and Dragons. In that book, they do mention that um, it was kind of revolutionary at the time for Gary Gygax to kind of take Chainmail and adapt it the way he did because uh, supposedly, anecdotally, the idea is that uh, he looked at the units he had in his Chainmail army, band, group, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and he kind of uh, examined it and goes, well, what if this person was like a, a character? What if they were a person with hopes and dreams and aspirations, feelings, etc.? Uh, what if we expanded upon that and you played the role of this sergeant or this knight or whomever in this chainmail game? Uh, and I find that very interesting that that wasn't assumed at the time. You know, it was just a, my group of knights versus your group of knights, and they're knights, they're doing knight stuff. But now it's, uh, you know, what is my knight feeling? What is he thinking? Who is my knight? You know, oh, they're a fighting man, or oh, they're a wizard, or what have you. Yeah, I, I, I do find it kind of funny that the world's most foremost role-playing game, Dungeons and Dragons, came out of a tabletop versus game, and the world's foremost tabletop versus game, Warhammer 40k, started as a tabletop RPG at Rogue Trader. So they almost were like, hey, we really want to do the thing the other person is doing, and they just traded spots. Yeah. To sort of, you know, change some of the stuff around, make sure my homework doesn't match with that. Yeah, file off the serial numbers. Yeah, <laughs> just a back alley trade. Yeah. Um, the nice thing about the first edition, though, is whether you were had bad stats or good stats, there wasn't a whole lot of change for it. So you playing a fighter or you playing a cleric doesn't really do much to affect it. Just on the bigger end, you have bigger things for it. So with that, Gary Gygax decided that um, and his team that works on Ninjas and Dragons decided that they're going to make a second, uh, an advanced version. So this is what we know as uh, the AD and D, Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons is about 1979. And with that, um, if you ever watch anything that mentions Dungeons and Dragons and it's the 80s, like Stranger Things or various other shows, this is the version they're all talking. Additionally, where the Satanic Panic comes in from the... Yeah, movie. that's also where it is. The movie Mazes and Monsters, Tom Hanks' best role. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, Leo, one thing, the the first supplement that came out for first edition, which introduces us to Greyhawk, which for people who are co only come around in the fourth and fifth edition, so if you're new to D&D, you may not recognize that, that title or that place. That was where the core of D&D took place forever. Uh, that introduced the thief. That, yeah, that so you did get your first bonus class, if you will, in your very first book. And so 
uh, when I when I came up playing D&D, I was always told there's four general roles. There's a divine character that does the healing. There's the magic user, in this case is what it's called, that does all the, the wizard style spell casting, so like Gandalf. Um, there's your, your knight, your warrior, which would be your fighting man. And then there's your cunning person or your skill person. And those four characters, um, I know we'll get to third edition. No, we'll get there, yeah. Are, are what the third edition player's handbook recommends you start with, one in each one in each category for your party. Well, I'm jumping the shark a little bit as well, but the in fifth edition. The whole shark? Yeah, the whole shark. Sorry. Okay. The whole shark. Wait, not the whale. Probably not a hammerhead, but, okay. like, you know, something. Well, they have weird Tiger weird. shark, maybe. Tiger. So they can jump. I mean, yeah. That, All right. That's what makes it cool. All right. Uh, but in fifth edition, when they were playtesting it, they released a free rule set, which is still available today, uh, which includes the four core characters. Yes. Yeah. Fighter, uh, cleric, mage, or wizard. And rogue. And rogue. Yeah. And so those are your core characters. Now, the popularity of the rogue is what it originally was. I think started with B and UD. At that point, when they came with the Dance of the Dragons, they just sort of got rid of the of needing chainmail altogether. That's the, the, the core reason of making this change is so that way they don't need to have a supplement to go with a main game. It's kind of like buying your DLC first, then having to buy the game. It's just, I, I'm going to level you with you is a terrible strategy. <laughs> so, with that, we go on to Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. Advanced Dungeons and Dragons was designed mostly to give yourself a straight base. I have one drinking problems. I can't get to it. I got you. Yeah. So, but it's mostly, as far as the classes go, it was designed to better organize it and remove chain. That's the core of this whole thing. So now we have Dungeons and Dragons as a true RPG. At this point, um, and we'll get to the whole uh, satanic scare real quick as a yeah, side note, because that is fixed in second edition. Fix is a strong word. Yeah, that's very strong. Very strong. <laughs> um, so, with it in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, you now have a set of new classes. You have the Paladin, you had um, the Druid, and they all sort of fell into. You still had fighting men for some reason. That is still a thing. So many fights. And what more do you need? Maybe a fighter? Nope, not a fighter. Well, it's also, so AD&D, I'm pretty sure AD&D First Edition called him fighter. Uh, but then that's also the first place. So just out of curiosity, how many of you are have played mostly or exclusively in Fifth Edition? So a few of you. OK, uh, that's also the first. AD&D first is the first introduction of, introduction of subclasses, and then they disappear until Fifth Edition again. Um, third goes a completely different direction with them. But Druid is actually a subclass of Cleric. In AD&D, uh, assassin becomes a thief subclass. Paladin and ranger subclass. So fighter, your first illusionist uh, shows up during that time, and they're all subclasses. Um, what three five will turn into prestige classes yeah. uh, for them. But yeah, you, you do get some of those before 1980. You're getting introduced to, to terms that are going to be the core of Dungeons and Dragons for the rest of the rest of the time that we do them. And we leave some of those colloquial terms like fighting man behind and magic user. Mm -hmm. um, oh, this is also the first time that they introduce a new class, monk. Yep. But they'll get too attached to them. By the 90s, the monk is gone. And they'll come back later in the 90s, like flare pants and this thing it does. Um, so the issue with this one is that the classes are more defined. But because of that, that also means that the roles have to be more defined as well. So one of the biggest issues that some people had is Say you want to play a paladin. Just like in first edition, you have to roll your stats first. And if you do not have the stats to play the paladin, you just cannot play a paladin, regardless of what situation it is. Which, from the way it looks like, not a lot of people got a chance to play the paladin because it's not one, it's three stats that you have to match up, and you also have to play a lawful good as an alignment. This is where the alignment system is sort of kicking in. They, in general, the line assist is just for class purposes, used to enhance your roleplay, make people actually roleplay more. You can't just go sword and board and slash your way through and still have the super cool powers of a paladin. That's not how that paladin works. But you also need to roll hard. So, in 5th edition, to roll your stats, you have, uh, I believe the main rule is you roll four dice, the six sided dice, and then you remove one. That has actually been in place since the beginning. So what you're talking about is rolling for each of your stats conditionally. And so if your strength is just happens to be higher than nine, but not as high as 15 that you rolled, 
you can't think out. You're just kicked out of them. That's just how that goes down. I do kind of have a question. For those of you who have played AD&D or know somebody who has played AD&D, have any of you heard of somebody rolling an 18 double zero? Because I have. To so explain that a little bit, so uh, if you were playing a fighter, a barbarian, a paladin, uh, some sort of martial class in uh, the older editions, the highest your strength could be would be an 18 slash double zero. Meaning you have an 18, and once you roll 18, that's the highest roll you could get at this time. There's not modifiers uh, as we think of them today. But you then roll a percentile dice to determine what percentage of your strength is uh, good, I guess. I, I don't quite remember the terminology that they use. Uh, but double zero being 100 was as high a strength as a character could have uh, from level one. Uh, and to this day, I don't know anyone who's rolled an 18 double zero. Like, it's so minute, it does such a little bonus. It changes fine. everything, though. Yeah, it does. At double zero, I mean, you know, I think it's a plus six. Yeah, you get a plus six to any of your strengths that basically you're not even needing to roll. Which was a lot back then. Yeah. I think it was only about I think well, you're right. You're right, it was. I think you're right. Uh, for the purpose of the podcast, that was only available. An option for fighters. Oh, was just, it? just to make sure yeah. that the microphone picks that up. My apologies. Yeah, no, that's fine. So, so he, could you imagine an 18 double zero wizard? I, mean, I would love to. Yeah. yeah. Just muscle, <laughs> muscle, muscle, <laughs> muscle wizard cast fist. Punching <laughs> everything. Um, so, with that, they also did. Um, yeah, I think it's ADD &D that starts multi classing as well. Yeah. That's so, multi classing allows you to play more than one class. Here's a caveat to that you can't be human. That's the one thing with that. If you're a person, if you're human, you cannot be a, a no class. Now, coincidentally with that, if you're any mixed race or any other race, so elf, or for such, you can't max out on any of on any of the levels of those classes. So, you want to be a dwarf cleric? Sure, you're not going to be as good as a human cleric by the end of the game, but you know, you're you're still a dwarf cleric. Enjoy. So you always got to mix it up. Though. As a disclaimer, so uh, older versions of this game that we all love, and some new versions of this game that we all know and love, are problematic in some ways. Yeah, yeah, there's no problems with that. But um, so if, even if you're one character, you still can't, may not be able to play the character you want. That's sort of the gist of it. Now, with that being said, though, there's also some weird bonuses that run around that I don't think are in fifth edition, but they're in first and second edition. If your strength is high enough, like 15 or higher, and you're a fighter, because you picked the fighter as your class and your strength as a class, you get a bonus to gaining EXP. You could power level someone just because your stat is higher than everyone else's. So it really wanted you to lean towards your stats on that one. Now, they all had their own special unique abilities as that. Clarence could heal, uh, Druids could also heal, but not as good. Um, thieves have their own uh, stuff, and I think this is where they start doing Thieves Can't, which what can Thieves Can't do, I don't know. But... They better bring a 10-foot pole, that's it, all I'm saying. Yeah. Which is the weirdest, like, inventory in space. How many of you guys are going to walk around with a 10-foot pole somewhere? It's necessary. For those who may have played older editions, uh, especially older modules, uh, pre-written modules, you, you will know uh, the 10-foot pole is the most important item you could bring to a dungeon at all. Uh, and basically how that played out, and this is very riveting, so uh, bear with me, but uh, you would send the rogue ahead with their 10-foot pole, and they would tap, and then they would tap, and then they would tap, as they move forward, looking for traps. Because if you didn't do that, you'd fall into a spike trap and die, probably. And yeah, traps were... Yeah. First and second, you'd think third edition and, and fourth and fifth edition traps are nasty. Second edition traps just killed you. Yeah. Like, there wasn't a... There, there's no you've just, there's you've no just fall in a hole and die. <laughs> like that's that's really all that you've got to do. The the whole saving throw mechanic hadn't been refined yet, and that's another thing that second edition really gives to D and D is the saving throw mechanic. But even then, it wasn't really refined, and it was kind of a hodgepodge. And like first edition DMs, and again, I've played first edition, but it was the active edition. Second edition comes out in 1989. I was born in 1985. So my group started playing with second edition, but we still used a lot of first edition material because there wasn't a ton of second edition material out at the time. Um, and so some of those things stuck around. 
10 foot pole being one of them. Of course, the most infamous dungeon of all time, Tomb of Horrors. Uh, if you did not have a 10 foot pole in Tomb of Horrors, that dungeon module is entirely impossible to complete. You, you will die. Yeah, you just. Uh, my sister, who's not here today, desperately wants you for one of her birthdays to do a Tomb of Horrors drinking game where everybody rolls up 10 characters. When your character dies, you take a shot, you grab the next one off the pile and go. So she wants to kill your characters she, and, and her you. players. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. she gotcha. also gotcha. to be dead. So I guess the moral of the story is that if you want a fun drinking party, do that and make sure no one brings a 10 foot pole. Yeah, yeah, you ban the 10 foot pole outright. <laughs> yeah, ban the 10 foot pole outright. That's the. You, you tell someone you can only have a 10 foot pole if you physically bring a 10 foot pole to the game. Yeah, I'm doing that. <laughs> I, I, for one, am tired of this 10 foot pole erasure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So amongst the things with the issues with these classes are at this point is just asymmetrical um, level wound, which gets funky and not really, depending on who you are, or you either love that because you can power level or you hate it because you're, you can fall behind. Um, stat requirements for your classes is a big thing issue with that, but hey, it forces you to do more role playing on that. And um, for the Paladin and the Druid specifically, if you do not play within your alignment, you can be revoked and booted as to into being a fighter from that from that on. So it's always a plan to not only not to get the player class for like three uh, for like till you're level three, you screw up and change, yeah, you have to change classes. I do find it interesting. I think that's really where we see the trope of the lawful stupid, quote unquote, yeah. coming, coming into play. Uh, for those of you who may not know what that is. Uh, there is a stereotype that paladins are played one way, you know, they are for truth and justice and for my god and I can't allow you to do anything evil or terrible or whatever. Uh, as long as I'm around, no torture or, you know, stealing or anything untoward shall happen. And so, uh, if anyone's group is, was like mine at the time, there was yeah. a lot of like, hey paladin, what's that over there? <laughs> cool. Thank you. Yeah, you, have a, some stuff. you have a specific character whose job it is to distract the paladin. Yeah, the paladin yeah. wrangler. Mm -hmm. Typically a thief. It's, Typically do these things. It's a, a nun class. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go steal a bird. Not today or not. Yeah. Well, if if you have a if you have like a, a a wizard in your in your party, you can just engage them in a philosophical conversation about the nature of evil, and then let the thief steal everything. <laughs> They'll fall for it every time. I actually kind of want this idea. I'm down. Yeah. Are we, are, Leo, are we on to second edition? Yeah, at this point, we can move on to second edition. Okay, so one of the big things that, that Leo mentioned, and it, it doesn't go away in second edition, is having to roll the proper stats for your class. But one thing that second edition fixed was that your base version of your class, fighter, wizard, priest, rogue, whatever, uh, could have a minimum of a nine and still progress in it. So if you wanted to play a martial character and you roll terribly, you could still play the base fighter without having to have like the 18 or the 16 to do the paladin or whatever. So you could still play the type of character you wanted to, maybe not the special class. Um, so that was kind of um, a forgiveness button, I guess, that got slapped onto D&D. &D. They did a couple of forgiveness things. So in third edition, what they added in there, oh, talk about second, second, second still, right. yeah. You, you had the, oh, no, they still did that there. You had a couple of classes you could play with bad rolls, but then everything else you had to move on. And I remember being like 12 on a camping trip trying to play a game of AD&D &D with some, some older friends of mine. And um, I was having particularly like notorious dice luck. And I desperately wanted to play like this, this thief style character and uh, could not get the requisite rolls. And I spent two hours by myself while everyone else started playing desperately trying to get the right role to play the character I wanted. Finally got it. Uh, finally got it. And in, a, in an encounter with a ogre, I, again, being a 12-year-old and very influenced by action movies, assumed that the hand crossbow would work the exact same way as a real one. So I walked up in an ogre fight. I, I got it basically melee and pointed it center mass and pulled the trigger thinking, this thing's going to die. It didn't. And then I did. Immediately. Bam, done, one hit KO. Uh, it was like the fourth character I'd ever made. It was the, I'd spent extra hours trying to make this happen. And I spent the rest of the afternoon inconsolable, throwing rocks in the river while everyone else played DD &D and I got stuck on the edge. So uh, I am, when third came out and got rid of that mechanic, it changed my life. Were your stats good though? No. no. I only had the one good stat in, in necessary to play the character. 
and like I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure so Dane and I have, have known each other a long time. I'm pretty sure my mom showed you the picture of me sulking by the river. I think you're right. <laughs> just uh, there are no more no more rocks in my vicinity. It's all just dirt and sand, and I've thrown them all into the river and just sad facing. And then there's another picture of like Mike and those guys playing D and D without me. Uh, yeah, they're all having a, the best time, and I'm very much not. So. Uh, I feel bad about this, but here's how some of the research went. In second edition, they made you they added six different ways to give all your stats for your character. Yeah. That didn't happen for me. <laughs> nope. <laughs> so what I'm talking about is this. This is what I introduced. If you don't want to roll your character, you can actually just pick they give you a uh, there's about six different ways to do that. One of them is that they give you a set of stats that you can uh, that you can divide up for your character. The big upside to that is the lowest stat you can pick on that is a 10. The downside to that though is, oh, is it not? The downside to that is you can't get very high stats either. The maximum stat is like you think a 15. Yeah, you're right. And then, so they allowed you to do that. They allowed you to roll um, the same 40, uh, 46, so 46 sided dice and then take one away, like that's the standard panel. Um, there's also one where you can just, uh, Roll individually for each stat and then redistribute it later. So they give you a bunch of options. The caveat to that is you get one, and the, G and the DM can actually pick the dungeon master to pick if he doesn't want you to roll that. So yeah, you might have gotten hosed. I, I sure did. <laughs> it, what's funny is the other five players all got exactly what they wanted on their first try. So. Uh, and most of them were just playing the base class, right? So they, they only needed their nine in whatever their main stat was, and it, it went fine, and it was a one-shot, and I should have just played something else. Uh, but I desperately wanted to play this, like... I had I had this whole backstory stuck in my head, and, and yeah, it did not... Uh, it lasted all of, like, 15 minutes, and then I went and soaked by the river for the afternoon. That's rough, buddy. I didn't even swim. I just threw rocks in the river and looked sad. <laughs> like, if the recording, if the Johnny Darko recording of Mad World had existed at the time, like that would have been playing on repeat in the background. Have you ever gone back and, and destroyed that ogre? Like, in your own game at home? No, no. So throw an ogre at your players no, and then, like, kill them for me. No, I, uh, it's a trauma that I refuse to let heal. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Gary, I know you fixed this. I choose not to. Because, not to be because Gary Gag Gygax is no longer alive, I can no longer make him pay for it personally, and therefore it's a revenge that will never be satisfied. Um, so here's the thing. Second edition, the reason why this is a big one is that second edition is, this is where we start getting into wanting to get Dungeons and Dragons into the mainstream. There's about, in the, unlike the other manuals, there's 20 pages of text to explain what a, what a tabletop role-playing game. They really wanted to make hammer down that anybody can play this. You, before then, it was sort of, you had to know a guy who knew him. Someone's older brother, yeah. family member, typically, yeah. You still, you still kind of, well, no. Fifth edition really achieved. Oh, fifth they edition, were, yes. Fifth, achieve, fifth edition really achieved what they were trying to do a second. Um, in second, you still kind of had to know a guy who knew a guy, especially if you were young, um, you know, 10, 11, 12, and weren't good at math. Yeah. 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 You Fair still had to know somebody. Was your, so was that your first game? No, no. no. Uh, that was I, I'd been playing on and off for about four years at that time. Okay. Um, but I, they'd been kind of uh, really assisted games. So, so I started playing around when I was eight. Obviously, when you're eight, if you've ever, if you remember what it's like being eight, you're not very rational. If you have children who've been eight recently, then you really know they're not rational. And so, uh, older cousins, kind of like, and, and friends of the family would kind of like hold, you know my hand through like what's going on and I'm positive my DMs fudge rolls to make it so that the kid at the table could play. Um, this incident is kind of like where I really wanted to like do it all on my own and I really want, no I don't need help anymore, I'm 12, I can do this. And um, how many of you have played second edition? Okay, so you know that a 12 year old really can't do it on their own. Um, no. Second edition gave us, and I'm gonna say this, despite hating fourth edition more than everything else in my life, uh, gave us the worst D and D mechanic of all time, and Dane has it written down at the top of his sheet there. Uh, Thacko, or to hit armor class zero. Uh, we might be fighting after this. I, I have some things. Thac Thacko's the worst. Uh, it's extra. It's extra the worst if you're not good at math. Um, and it is the most backwards, in my opinion, backwards D and D mechanic of all time. And I'm so glad that it's dead. And uh, I hate it more than I hate that ogre. 
Oh, yeah, wow. yeah, that's the, that's the yeah. yeah, that guy was unhealed trauma. We, we found the villain's origin story. Yeah, <laughs> right. If I someday go crazy and blow up a bank, it's because of that guy. Uh, <laughs> for those of you who may not know, uh, so typically in a more modern, I will say, uh, tabletop role-playing games, your armor class ascends. So you start at 10, let's say, and go upwards of whatever your armor class can be for whatever game you're playing. That wasn't the case in second edition. Uh, I actually kind of like Flacco, and maybe it's because I was a kid who didn't understand it, but no one else did either, so it kind of makes sense <laughs> uh, in its own weird way. You just made up Flacco was whatever you wanted it to be. Yeah, the yeah. Flacco was the friends we made if, along the way. If you just <laughs> believed in your in your own Flacco, yeah, you couldn't yeah. be it. Yeah. Um, I was playing a ranger, so it's not like Flacco was really that great for me. Anyway, no, it's not no, like you, were, monk, you had the fuzzy end of that one. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. usually do rangers. So, but, um, not in this edition. I mean, that's true. That's true. But anyway, go. Yeah. Uh, but Thacko, you go negative, so uh, a negative five was a really good armor class, which sounds really weird when you say it out loud nowadays, because you're like, I wish you want a negative armor class, but it meant you were harder to hit uh, in its own, own way. Also, uh, I didn't mind Thacko, it was the grappling charts that did me in. I, I don't want a primer on grappling that I have to consult every time I try. Yeah, I, I, de I definitely remember Staring at those and going, I just hit him. Yeah, like, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. not worth. Yeah, I'd be like. Eh. So, how many of you have seen the GIF meme of like Math Lady with like all the formulas floating? <laughs> to try to figure out grappling in Second Edition, it's that plus uh, Russell Crowe's character in A Beautiful Mind. Like, you needed that level of understanding of mathematics and physics to get the grappling chart. Uh, unfortunately, my Second Edition handbook, which I meant to bring, is is locked up somewhere in my house after we moved. I still haven't unpacked it. But almost a year, um, and so all my second edition stuff is still locked up, except my monster manual, which I should have brought anyway. But you can Google those charts; they're they're free to look they're at. They're free to look at, and they're nuts. And or you can just upset your your DM like I did because needed a uh, needed a blunt weapon to attack a guy, so I picked up a rat and started swinging that for a while. Oh, rat flail! Yeah, rat flail. Totally works out. Checks out. Yeah, rat flail a, a lot has a lot. Of <laughs> <laughs> but so with that, that's the. The goal of second edition was to make it more friendlier to um, new players. That's the goal, that's not exactly how it came out. Um, you still had a bunch of requirements for your classes. Uh, if you wanted to play something funky like a monk, that's gone at this point. Because if grappling is a mess, we'll just get rid of the grappling expert entirely as a class. And so, with that, that's sort of the thing. But at this point, it is 1989, I think. Yep. So here's where the demonizing uh, sort of gets changed around. They have to create a whole new edition for it. So in that, things like angels, demons, and anything that speaks of that got switched up in the monster manual. Now, why that's important is because that also messed with clerics and druids because now their whole chart thing has to be rewritten to understand what they can and can't do. And it was just a, just sort of a mess on that. Don't stick too hard on it though, because they get rid of it in third edition pretty fast. I believe it's at this time, or maybe it was uh, with AD&D, that uh, they got into a little bit of hot water with the Tolkien estate, uh, because they had Ents, they had uh, Balrogs, they, I mean, they basically just ripped off the monsters from Tolkien and were like, yeah, they're, they're fantasy monsters in our game now. and. Uh, that flew for a little bit, but... Uh, no, this is where they did have to change it up. That's where we so, get the Baylor instead of the Balrog. Uh, you get uh, tree ends instead of ends. You just file off the serial numbers and it's okay. Mm -hmm. Some big ones that they did, one of the classes, one of the races that you could be is, ha is Halfling. It used to actually be called Hobbits. Yeah. That will have gotten into real hard work on that. So they had to change it up for a bunch of stuff because the Tolkien said is no joke against that. Um, the only two that they got to hang on to was dwarves and elves. And that's because they could prove how much lore that was like that, that wasn't exclusively Tolkien. Yeah, Tolkien stole those. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, Tolkien stole those. Tolkien's a whole different uh, ballgame on that. But to say that Dungeons & Dragons is not inspired by Tolkien would be to say that I don't like rice with curry, it's just a thing you're gonna have. Yeah, like, Tolkien may have stolen from, from like, a hit, like, folklore and stuff, but then, I mean, if you really want to get reductionist, 
there's not really original thoughts anymore, like at all ever. So except for my homebrew campaign. No, that's one hundred percent. You ripped off the Thundercats, and they have things to say about that's it. Fair. That's fair. Um, so you know, Tolkien's based on is based on is based on like Tolkien's not the original fantasy story. Like Conan the Barbarian is older than, than Tolkien um, by a, well older than the Hobbit for sure by about forty years. You get some of your first Conan stories in the eighteen eighties that are published, and he was writing them in the eighteen seventies. And then you can go further back from there to you know uh, other. You can, I mean, you can go all the way back to I mean, Mallory didn't invent the Arthurian legend, but he wrote the first version of it in the fifteen forties. And so mm. nights, yeah, you, and, and then back and back and back and back. So I, I've always. I've always kind of thought that it was funny that Tolkien got litigious over his intellectual property when most of it was stolen, right? Like, he didn't invent elves, dwarves, orcs, goblins, uh, maybe not even trees that move, right? Because you've got all the, and then you've got all these cultural and historical monsters that get worked in. And um, I think the only original thought in Dungeons and Dragons is the Beholder. Yes. Um, I know it's one of the first original monsters. Everything else is kind of based on something. But the, even, the, even the Beholder, you can go like, Octopus, but eyes. Like it's everything's based on something, right? So uh, I've always kind of raised my eyebrow at the Tolkien estate when they've gotten litigious, and been like, okay, buddy, but like Sir Thomas Mallory wants to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. So he's dead, though. So they both are now. Take it. Take that, old dead white guys. <laughs> one, right. Yeah. 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 Um, one thing as a quick aside, if I may, um, I do find it interesting the first miniatures. Uh, that Gary Gygax and his crew used for Dungeons and Dragons uh, that weren't chainmail miniatures repurposed. They would go to their local toy and hobby stores and they would just paint over the, the miniatures or the, the toys that they could find there. And that is how you get some of the original monsters, uh, is that they, they took a dinosaur and cut the horns off and they were like, ah, it's a, you know, an Umberhall or whatever. Uh, which I, fi I find really fascinating. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good. If you're if you are hard pressed for figurines, don't play the figurine or make something up. I've played with like bottle caps. Candy is a mistake. I mean, your candy is great. You know, you can eat your enemies. Yeah, except I made my character. The yeah, I didn't want to die. Full full painted miniatures or GTFO. Oh yeah. Theater of the mind well, or GTFO. Fair. No. You, you so, and GTFO. That's fair. I'll, 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 uh, thank you for anyway, you. yeah. So yeah. getting back to this, um, one of the things is that because of that whole thing about demonizing for it, that clerics got the option to basically the, the dungeon master had the option to just make up a god and that's your problem now. They literally and it's just a list of five things: make up, make up your deity, make up your uh, what weapons that you can and can't use, make up whatever armor the rules that you can and can't use. That's your your bad. You deal with it. And so that was weird because Claire's is the only one that got that kind of freedom. Everything else is sort of here's how the rules set up. Unless you're Claire, get, uh, whatever he says is. Bill says it's cool. That's how I am. I do kind of like that this is where you start to see uh, actual religious figures coming into the DD space. So, you know, you could be a cleric to Thor, uh, and that was pretty, pretty uh, commonplace at the time, or whomever. You know, you, you pick a god. Uh, that these kids in the 80s and 90s have probably read a book on, right, or heard, heard the name of, and they're like, yeah, I'm a cleric at Thor. Cool. And it doesn't have any basis on the actual, you know, religious connotations or the, the stories that are in, but, uh, yeah, I find that interesting. That's, that's where you get St. Cuthbert coming into the Greyhawk yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, pantheon. The, uh, I'm not sure if he's official in the second ed one. I know for sure he is in the third edition, Greyhawk Pantheon. Uh, St. Cuthbert's an actual Catholic saint, and she's, like he got popular enough with the guys who were writing it, and was used over and over again, and, and what limited pre-internet file sharing there was, you could get stats and stuff for St. Cuthbert, and he just made it into a book. So, yeah, to kind of continue yeah. with that, right? Uh, I, I do find it interesting that you also get, you know, created gods, coming into this space as well, so Helm, Torm, etc. I mean, we, we don't see them in this genre necessarily, but in addition to having, like, real gods and real gods in D&D, you've got fake gods in D&D next to real gods in D&D, which I just think is, is, is hilarious a little bit when you think about it. Um, additionally, I do find it interesting that the, the naming conventions of a lot of spells just come from famous people playing this game. You know, Morden Kanan uh, being a prime example, 
you know, people who played in Gary Gygax's home game just created spells, and then they were named after them. Tensor is one of them I know. Um, yeah. Tasha Ooh. comes from that too. Yeah. 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 So with that, um, this is where you're starting to see homebrewing becoming a bigger thing. This is where, uh, like, it's still, it was always like under the table, change and fudge a couple of rules if you want to. But after second edition, this is where homebrewing is going. There, you'll start seeing it in the manuals themselves, where they start. It's like I know in fifth edition, it's like one of the first things that they tell you: if you don't like the rules, change it. We're not even though it doesn't matter to us. Um, and that's sort of the thing with that. Uh, so yeah, from second edition, they try to fix up everything on there and try to get it to this. I guess they think at this point we should move on to the third edition. Let's do it. Oh yeah, I'm, I've been waiting all day. Oh, I see. I'm gonna. Oh man, I see. I see a head shake there. I'm gonna fix that. Do you, make, do you like third edition? I, Is that something you enjoy? I, I have. I have once been described, perhaps by myself earlier today, in a text message, as if third edition were a person. Oh. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think I've ever heard you talk about. It. No, uh, you've never heard me talk about third edition. No, I don't you've think never so. seen the fact that I own every single three and three point five book that's ever been printed. I don't think I've seen that. In book. in physical copy on I, my I wall. Don't, I don't think I play in the third edition you, game with you either. You didn't <laughs> see my massive meltdown when fourth came out, and it was basically. Fun. Final Fantasy, the role playing game. Oh, it was hilarious. <laughs> All I was told about this is make sure to click to rain that one in. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to, we'll get to yeah, we, have, we will. We'll come to Bill's yeah. yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, so, so being being the resident third edition expert, uh, and I brought my uh, first player's handbook that I bought, and I've used it so much you can see that it's it's falling apart. Um, or this is my three five one. The big thing about so, and I, I mentioned this to Dane earlier when we were prepping for this discussion. I personally believe, and I think he's on board, the largest change to Dungeons & Dragons in, in between editions that's ever happened is between 2nd and 3rd edition. There's yeah. a bunch of reasons for that, and one of them is that TSR no longer owned D&D, Wizards of the Coast did. Wizards buys D&D uh, in 97 and releases 3rd edition in 2000, so they worked on it for three years behind the scenes. I remember playing, so 97 to 2000, I was in junior high and then in high school, I remember playing second edition, knowing that there was a new edition coming, and, and just speculating, sitting at the lunch table, um, playing Magic the Gathering, which I also started playing in the early 90s, and being really excited that the same people who ran Magic now owned D&D, and that suddenly we were going to get all these cool things, because Magic had a tournament circuit, and we were speculating, are there going to be D&D tournaments, and then like, how would you even do that, and then like, character battle royales, and just absolutely annoying the cheerleaders that sat at the table next to us uh, with all of our nerd talk in between in between lightning bolts and stuff um, and so when third came out uh, my group I, at that point I had a dedicated all the time group that I was playing with uh, made up of my high school buddies one of whom I still play with every other Sunday uh, so that's been nice uh, when D&D dropped when D&D third edition drops in 2000 we were playing all the time we ran right out we bought the three pack um, I then bought the Leatherbound 3-pack uh, when it came out, when they, when they upgraded to 3.5, and there were, it was like a whole new world. Uh, one, instead of having like six classes with subclasses, subclasses were gone, and I had 11 classes to choose from. Yeah, they're just classes. They're, yeah. Flat out. I have, I have like eight races I can pick from. Mm -hmm. it, no, no restrictions on races playing anything, so I can finally be the uh, the halfling uh, fighter with little man syndrome I've always wanted to play. Uh, what Sam should have been with that um, pot. <laughs> uh, and so, so third, it got rid of Thacko, which I cannot tell you how happy I was about that. And numbers finally made sense. Um, I, 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 you and me, parking lot after this. Uh, and what's, what's also really fascinating is um, there was no 4.5, but if you think about AD&D for first edition, that was 1.5. Yeah. And second edition had some revisions that came out, some errata. Second edition dies at the dawn of the internet, kind of. Um, but you could still get download, and you could still download uh, TSR's internet-based errata for second edition, like their fixes, because the internet in the 90s, um, it would take four hours, and you had to hear the dialogue sound. I see some faces that know what that sound, or remember what that sound sounds like, but you could get them. Play the song by people. Exactly. Mom, get off the phone. Yeah, get off the phone, Mom. I'm trying to download Errata. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, a couple of other... My mom once. It is hard when you're your parents are from another country oh, and God. they don't understand them. 
uh, now I'm cur now I want to I want you to do a skit for your YouTube channel that's that uh, in 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 the appropriate languages no subtitles let people guess um, third edition also gives us two very other important inventions in addition to the internet it gives us the first D and D movie. Yeah. Which also came out in in two thousand. Um, yeah, it's it's, from the second D and D movie. Well, it didn't come out in two thousand. No, it didn't. But it came out after the first. Almost movie. all of the D and D movies are third edition. Um, yeah. That movie, if you haven't seen it, don't. If you, <laughs> it's if, if, it's, unless it's you hate yourself and then go for it. I love uh, it. It's Jeremy crazy. Irons is is, is redeemable. Uh, but that's what happens when you make a movie where your two characters are two third level rogues. That's yeah. that's the problem with that movie. Now there were some. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like his performance. He just should have been something else. Um, now, there are additional D&D movies that are more true to what it's like playing D&D. The Wrath of the Dragon God, if you haven't seen it, it's a terrible B-movie, but it actually is what a D&D party would look like in real life. And they find all these like classic uh, magic items, including, and they use a Ring of the Ram, which is cool to see on screen. Um, they Rising is one of my favorites. Yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, classic. I know some of those guys. Anyway. <laughs> Uh, the Forge Phone made all our weapons. Oh, really? That one. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, the other thing it gave us is the D&D Miniatures versus game, which everyone ignored, and instead used them for their tabletop. So all of those things are Wizards of the Coast inventions. Critical Role would not be what it is today if it weren't for third editions uh, advancements through like getting their errata and stuff out on the internet and also the miniatures that were born out of that. You know, kind of to go along with that, I remember so third edition was the first edition that I bought with my own money. And then, you know, my friends and I, we scrapped, we saved, we, we were in McCall, we went to a local game store that was there and we bought the first three set of third edition. And what blew my little mind at that time is that in the back of it, there was a CD that you could put into your computer to create characters. Yeah. And you can computer generate your character sheets for the first time. Blew my mind. Yeah. You know, I spent countless hours going home and just making random characters and not having to waste paper because it was all digital. So, and, and here's the other thing about the big shift between TSR and uh, Wizards of the Coast. First edition and, and AD and E are published between what 74 and 89. 74 and 89. Second yeah. edition between 89 and 2000. So that's only 11 years. Third edition only exists for eight years, yeah. Yeah. 2000 to 2008 is, 08 is when fourth is invented. However, fourth flop, we'll get to fourth video, but it flopped so bad that they count those year, the fourth years as three, five years. So you could really argue that, because they kept printing three, five, um, they, did, they did additional print runs, and then they did an option where you could buy books that were out of print in individual print runs with a soft cover. So I actually owned some, some pay on demand print runs. Uh, Warhammer 40,000 has been doing this with some of their older miniatures lately where they'll do like an on-demand print run of their minis. Um, but you could buy on-demand books from them up until the time fourth, uh, up until the time they announced fifth, and that's when they stopped doing it. So in first and second, you have, I think, a total of, even with all the subclasses and stuff, about 11 or 12 different ways you can play your classes since that's what we're focusing on. Yeah. Focusing this gives you 11 base classes, and by the time 3.5 is done, you have 56 base classes. Only one of which is entirely unplayable. Anyone want to guess what that is? Unplayable? It's completely, it's, it's completely unplayable. It's so trash. It's completely unplayable. It's not Monk. It's, it's not Monk. Monk is broke into little pieces. And that's because one of the devs is a huge Bruce Lee fan. I don't know if you know this. That's a background story. One of the early devs on 3rd edition was a huge Bruce Lee nerd. And so they intentionally made Monk. And it was missing from the edition before, which you mentioned, right? Yeah. So they made it really, really powerful and then cried about it later when I banned it from my table. Uh, I was the one who cried about it. Yeah. Uh, was it a ranger? It's not a ranger. Ranger is actually one of the best and most survivable base classes from this book, um, which is true in 5th edition. I know it's probably the worst class, uh, but ranger was, was really, really good at this point, oh, especially no, if you have two of them. I'm sorry. I, mean, I thought... Oh, fourth edition of what we're talking about? No, no, no. In third edition, third edition. you get 56 base classes, so there's 56 different, and that, that subclasses in second edition become prestige classes, so if you, I, I, again, terrible at math, but I would wager there's probably close to two or three thousand different character options. Oh, so you, you, you were talking you about unplayable classes in fourth edition, you are talking about unplayable classes in third edition. Yeah, there's yes. only, of the 56 base classes in third edition, there's only one of them that's unplayable, and I was wondering if anybody knew what it was. Bart. Bart's totally playable and has one of the two best prestige classes in the game. Stop there. Yeah. Stop there in the lead. What is it? It is the True Namer. The True Namer, which comes from uh, one of the like really obscure books, is so bad 
that its own mechanics can't even function. Um, and you can't even turn it into the other thing, and I don't know, I didn't DM in second edition, so I don't remember if NPC classes were part of the DMG, but they are in third edition. And true name are so bad, DMs won't even use it as an NPC class, which are all inherently worse than player classes. Uh, some of the really nifty 3-5 classes that you get before we move on to 4th that don't kind of exist anymore are the Dread Necromancer. It was a way to take the Wizard uh, Necromancer specialty and go straight into it and not have to deal with any of the kind of uh, builds up. Oh, I told you to start, I thought you said Red Necromancer. No, Red Necromancer. <laughs> well, I guess I guess if you went real yeehaw, you could probably do that. Yeah. But Red <laughs> Necromancer. Uh, my favorite class of all time, which still has yet to see, so far as I know, a 5th edition corollary is the Favored Soul, um, mm. which is a sorcerer, a divine sorcerer, basically, um, and, and, and it's really nifty. There's uh, a divine soul sorcerer, but it's a little bit Sure. Um, and, and so, lots of options, right? You went from having very little options to having really um, uh, option paralysis. I've, I still DM in 3.5, I still play in 3.5, Dane plays in one of my 3.5 games. Um, this is still the edition that I like, and I mentioned before that I own all the books, so financially speaking, it was a huge investment. There is actually a line item on my homeowner's insurance that insures my 3.5 books because they're worth about $7,000. Um, it's the thing I own that's worth the most, so if my house burns down, I want them replaced. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, but, yeah, that's it's still what I play in, and, and sometimes you say, like, oh, what do you want to play, and people start to get in the weeds of what's possible, and they're like, I don't have any idea. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, you got some cool things uh, uh, that are really unexplored. Uh, our buddy Shane's playing the Factotum in the game that we're playing right now, okay. which is a little bit of all four archetypes. In fact, in a 20 level spread, it's five levels of everything. It's five levels of a martial class, five levels of a divine class, five levels of an uh, arcane class, five levels of a thief class. Um, and they kind of like deal with like knowing things. Uh, you can get through all manner of then prestige classes, which also explode the possibilities <laughs> into all sorts of dimensions and you get you get a, a wide range of things arcane trickster which is a subclass in fifth edition starts the three five push prestige class um shadow main inquisitor I, I think is coming uh you get some of these other uh, hexblade is a subclass in fifth edition is a player is a full pc class in third so Soul Knife is a full PC class in third. Uh, Psionics come into us, come to us in second edition, but really come into their own in third, uh, to the point where they're they're broken in some cases. And then um, you get artificers introduced as characters in third edition, uh, and they have uh, they're really great um, on their own. And then if you combine them with a book that came out called the Book of Vile Darkness, you can basically get infinite stuff without using your own XP, because if you just play an evil artificer, you can sacrifice very small children to fuel your XP engine. So, 3-5 uh, definitely got out there, got in the weeds. There were lots of things you could do with your classes, but it was also, because it was so wide and varied, it was also probably the easiest system to break from a character standpoint. A level nine monk can kill a, a, a colossal red dragon by himself. Uh, the artificer, you can get a wish engine, uh, basically an unlimited wish engine at about level 12. Yeah, that's um, like the biggest complaint with uh, third edition is that you could break a lot. You can, and so so it's really more. This is the other thing that at least in my playing history and maybe in yours too, when you started playing third edition, you started to have to implement what's called session zero. And session zero went more beyond, or uh, went farther beyond just getting together and making your characters. You then started to ask people like, what kind of game do you want to play? Like, do you want a power fantasy? Because I don't want to DM that. Like, I want to be able to challenge you. So then you had to start making like banning classes. For for my table, monk of the fifty six base classes, monk and artificer are the two that I banned. Um, like, I could like fifty six. That is the two that are easiest to break. Yeah, system. I could I could realistically and easily say instead of banning the monk, I'm going to ban these ten or other ten or twelve other things you need to make it broken. But it's just easier for me to just like nope. Now if I ever did if I ever got into Rokugan, which is the it's no longer politically correct, but it was labeled Oriental Adventures at the time, and I, I think it's called Adventures in the Far East. Um, the Rokugan campaign setting, um, I would probably allow a monk, but would do the other things where I would ban them. They just don't fit thematically in a, in a European fantasy game. Um, but you also got access to like a mainline ninja and a mainline samurai, and things like a spell thief. And Which also don't belong in a... Oh, I know. Okay. Oh, I know. Okay. Okay. So this yeah. is mostly like you were a buffet of character classes. You want it? We got it. Yeah, it's 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 as if Oprah were running uh, 
Uh, you get a class. Yeah, you get a class. class. You get a class. Everyone gets a class. I, it's almost as if Monty Cook's kid walked into the front door and said, "Hey, Dad, wouldn't it be cool if my wizard could also, I don't know, bench press a truck?" And he was like, "Sure, son. Let's make a warm age." <laughs> I do think that would be cool for the record. Yeah. Well, I said muscle wizard kills face. I mean, yeah, right. no, 100. So that's that's where I, that's where my love sits. I still love this edition. Like I still play it all the time. Um, I personally like how much class variation there is. As a DM, it's a lot of challenge. As a player, it's a lot of flavor. I could probably play D&D for the rest of my life um, and not play all the character options in, three, in third edition, which is why I, I really like it. Yeah. I can make Final Fantasy say saving, so I didn't. Suplex of Train. Suplex yeah. of Train. Suplex of Train. That's my jam. Well, and, if, and this third edition is also what gave us Eberron. I know a lot of you love Eberron. This is where it comes from. Um, and it well, also gets us Warforged, which I know is you know Warforged Coffee Lock and completely immune to sleep. Yep. 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 You just channel your spell slots, man. Yeah. All right. So I will gladly take all your third edition questions when we're done. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, and, but, and the answer is yes. If you want me to DM third edition for you, I will. In, in the interest of time, I think we'll leave third edition here for now. As I'll stay here. Uh, okay. You, okay. You can stay there. I'll, so, look, I'll look sideways at you while you talk about fourth edition. I don't know how this happened, but apparently I'm the fourth edition expert. Because um, you're the only person in the planet who played it. I, no, that's I, not I, true. Well, no, no, no. As a disclaimer, fourth edition does have problems. Uh, they tried something new and, by and large, were not wholly successful. But. They tried new things, and they tried to be innovative, and that is something that I, I do think deserves a little bit of respect. So, uh, please. Yeah, so, fourth edition, unlike the other ones, where it was, there, like you said earlier on the podcast, they, um, video games are inspired by Dungeons and Dragons. A lot of video games are inspired by Fourth edition is a little backwards. Fourth edition is inspired by video games. Specifically, MMOs, I believe, at that time, because it's, what is it, 2010? Yeah, that's typically the, the thing that people point to. I I was not there during the design process. They didn't consult with me. Uh, yeah. Wizards are out there, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I, I, can, I can speak to that just a little bit. Sure. So one thing I forgot to mention about third is if you turn your third edition book around, there's a little tiny red and white logo at the bottom <laughs> called the D20 system. It continues into fourth. You can see it. It's now yellow. Leo talked about the influence that D&D has. Third edition is where you could no longer... Wizards, just like Cards Against Humanity, realized they couldn't sue third-party content makers out of existence for making stuff that used their system. So instead, they were smart and said, you can buy the ability to use third edition mechanics from us. People did. It's why we have Green Ronin, it's why we get Paizo, and it's, it's why Pathfinder exists at all. Um, it's, it's where you get... Um, this was so successful, you could even play a Gundam game called Joven Chronicles with third edition mechanics. They had their own system, but they knew people wouldn't understand it because it's untellable. Uh, and so they added third edition mechanics into it. So if you want to play a Gundam Wing game with third edition mechanics, you totally can if you can find a Joven Chronicles book. Um, you can get it on Drive Through RPG. So they released as part of that a 3-5 book for Warcraft 3. Yep. Yep. So that's 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 where I'm getting at. So yeah, they were working with Blizzard sure. on D and D rules, and this is what came of that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely think that MMOs are an easy thing to point to. I don't know if it was necessarily the full like contributing factor, but I definitely think that fourth edition does speak towards MMOs and video games. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know if it was World of Warcraft. I don't know if it was. Uh, I don't know which goals, but the first one. World of Warcraft, it would be Final Fantasy XI before World of Warcraft, and then it was uh, like EverQuest. EverQuest. And that's like Morrowind? Yeah. yeah. So definitely, 4th edition does a lot of things correctly in my mind, but it also does a lot of things uh, a little bit hand-handedly. As an example, in, speaking of classes, the Warlord, I think, is probably, in my opinion, the most interesting of classes in the 4th edition book. Um, seven books, rather. Yeah because of what they were able to do. This was not your fighter, this was not your barbarian, this was not your run-of-the-mill kind of fighter man uh, from previous editions. This is somebody who's a tactician who allows, uh, through their own skill sets, to uh, allows other people to do other things. So this is where you get a lot of the fifth edition mechanics for the Battlemaster Maneuver Fighter, uh, where you can have somebody move and attack, or you know, all those sort of maneuvers that we get in fifth edition, you start to see in fourth edition which is a, a thing that I actually really kind of enjoy about that specific class. Now, that being said, they did divide the classes into sort of, um, they had specific terms for them. I know Blaster was one of them. Um, 
that's just was a long range fighter. They had um, power sets was another thing that they added in there. Power sets, yeah. Well, so you had basically cooldowns. You had uh, per encounter powers and you had per uh, day powers, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, and per encounter powers, exactly like it sounds, you could use them once per encounter. Per day uh, abilities you could use once per day. We see that again in 5th edition. Um, so there's a lot of interesting little tidbits, I think, in 4th edition, but the way that they went about it uh, was so drastically different from 3rd edition that I think there was a little bit of contention. Uh, in 3rd edition, you had so many options, and things were so wide open and so available for you, and in 4th edition, they kind of put those rails back up. Uh, they, they put the bumpers up for uh, bowling terminology, uh, where you could play a character, but your blaster did not functionally differ overtly much from another blaster, as an example. Uh, they might be doing different things, but it didn't feel too differently. Uh, so fourth edition, I mean, I think will probably be the thing we speak about the least. I don't think it's unsavable, but I do understand people's gripes with it. I think system, systematically it has a lot of really cool things in it, uh, but that's a little bit beyond the scope, I think, of this episode and this panel. Yeah, most of it is that they tried to do some um, really unique things. Cooldowns was a big thing that they tried to do. They added in different classes that could double up from other classes. So I think they had Monk and Fighters combined as one, but then you had things like Warlord, which used step, uh, tactics instead of spells. And it was just kind of all, all over the place. So, kind so of interesting. This is where we see Tiefling become a, mon or a player's handbook monster or character. Yeah. Yep. Uh, option as opposed to known, which was banished to the monster manual. I, I will say that is the best thing that 4th edition gave us were those animated shorts where oh the, the gnome c becomes a monster for the first time and gets a minion named Francis, which is a badger. I have a layer. I have a layer. Have, you seen, have layer? you seen those? Oh man. If you just yeah. look them up, they were for the release of 4th edition. They are hilarious. The uh, T-Flink's talking about like how, what it's like to be a, an actual character class now, and she's super jazzed about it, and, and the other gnome's like, I'm evil, ha! Yeah, the Ithalate is interviewing for minions, and he gets a, a, he's like stamping them like thrall or, or food, and then a gelatinous cube shows up, and he stamps a dessert. It's excellent. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're, they're peak. Speaking, I just, I just looked up, because I didn't do this beforehand. Yeah. Speaking about the timelines, you know, we talked about first edition being from like 74 to 89, mm -hmm. 89 to 2000 being second edition. Uh, uh, third edition goes from 2000 to 2008. 2000 uh, or 2009-ish. Uh, fourth edition only lasts four years. Yeah. It's 2010 yeah. to 2004, uh, four, 2014 is when fifth edition comes out. Yeah. It was so negatively received, and a, a big part of that, and the reason I wanted to go back and mention that open gaming license is because part of why fourth edition didn't go over very well is because one of the things with the fourth edition contract is they required they were requiring people to buy into a new license for 4th edition, and part of that agreement was they had to stop production on anything 3 or 3.5, and that is when Paizo said, no thank you, and released their own their own Pathfinder game, because they were making 3.5 stuff. Uh, they released that in 09, directly to, contri directly to compete with 4th edition. And if you look at the sales numbers, I don't have them in front of me, but I know I was around game shops and they're talking about it. Their fourth edition stuff was not selling, and Pathfinder was insanely popular. Yes, still is. Yeah, it's still, and, and we've got a new version of Pathfinder that does doesn't really look like three five. Uh, finally, um, but for the longest time, there was still some version of, of three five that was existing all the way through. Uh, yeah. And even the first Starfinder yep. uh, functioned off of the the three five thing. So. Um, it, whether or not the I, I do think is hearing you talk about fourth edition, obviously there's redeemable qualities, right? Yeah, yeah. Despite the fact there's only eight books and it only lasted for four years, um, there's a lot. There was a lot of speculation that it was this change in how wizards managed their gaming license that led to the lack of popularity in the new edition. And then I mentioned that I called this Final Fantasy the role playing game. That is not my original critique. <laughs> I've heard I've heard that from a number of sources who reviewed 4th edition that was like, if you wanted to play, they could have released all of these mechanics with a Final Fantasy skin on it and probably would have sold gangbusters. Sure. Oh, uh, yeah. It just wasn't D&D &D to a lot of people. And I think that's kind of where the difficulty comes in, right? You've got 3.5 and 3.0 before that, as well as, you know, Pathfinder kind of on the rise, uh, or on the horizon. And I think that because 4th edition is such a departure from kind of what people knew, and this is not a, if 3.5 is your favorite, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that because it is so different, so drastically different from what they knew of 3.5 and even second edition, first edition, because uh, I, I would argue that 3.5 and 3.0 look closer to 2 
AD&D and first edition than fourth does to any of them. Looking back, certainly mechanically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I can understand the like knee-jerk reaction of what is this? I hate it. It's different. I do think that in some cases, not in all cases, but people were maybe a little bit more critical than they needed to be. Uh, as an example, I think Minions is a great rule set out of fourth edition. Uh, basically, it allows you to do that cinematic movie, uh, you know, your group of players versus like a room full of goblins without having to sit down and stat out every single goblin. You could throw 50, 100 goblins at, at your players and they can just mow through them because they're minions, they have one HP. Uh, that's one mechanic I think is very good and was core to fourth edition, uh, just as an example. Yeah. So, yeah. Did you actually DM some fourth? Uh, I DM'd like two games of fourth, but I did play in a, a fourth game. Leo, did you DM any fourth? Uh, I haven't DM'd any fourth, but I have played fourth. Okay. Then. So, oh, I, I, yeah, I haven't. Uh, Having not DM'd it, yeah. uh, one thing I did hear about people who did was they, they mentioned that the uh, the combat system was much snappier. It was, yeah. it was way faster. That's its biggest advantage is 4th edition's combat was quick. Very quick. Compared to 3.5 and 5th edition. Yeah, 3.5 combat can take all night if you're not careful. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I think that, that intellectually, like thinking about it, that may have been an attempt to do with fourth what they eventually got right with fifth, yeah. and they attempted to catch video gamers and missed where they eventually caught YouTubers um, with fifth edition and making it more streamlined and family friendly and, and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So, uh, if nothing else, I'm just glad I, I heard a positive thing about fourth edition out of you. I, I, I didn't say it was what I said. I said it's what oh, I heard. Oh, I just want to make that gotcha. super clear. Sure. Uh, but okay. goodbye, fourth edition. Yes. Uh, you were short lived, and we hardly knew you. <laughs> true, true. So I uh, was going to bad joke. Uh, the the, 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 the joke. Okay, so Group A needs to get to these mountains, and it'll take them ten hours to get there. Group B needs to get to the other side of the city, and it'll take them twenty hours to, to get there. How many uh, random encounters are we going to do for these games? The answer is one, because I only have time to do one. Yeah. Yeah. So after fourth edition, and all the editions before that. And there is rules in every in most of those editions for NPCs. We just kind of missed that, but it was a big thing for first edition and second edition. But that's again because their their origins are coming from the strategy games. I, I will say here, I'm going to say something nice yeah. about fourth edition. It does have the best looking cover really nice. of any of the players' handbooks. Um, first and second had the heinous original 1970s art on it, and while a lot of people really like it and they worked really hard, uh, is this way in England? Who did the front cover? It'll be on the inside. Yeah, it'll be on the inside. Top yeah, whoever did did the art for. Uh, it's also on the Pathfinder one, I think, too. So, go ahead. Yeah, yeah so it's okay. good. We're at this point in time. We're going to start moving on to the fifth edition. If you've noticed the correlation of that, popularity is the big thing. First edition was to introduce. Second edition was to make it more streamlined. Third edition was to get. Role players in there, and at this point in time, we're talking about what is 2014. Yep. Yep. At this point, D &D next, D &D next. So role playing tabletops and those that like it are starting to get more and more streamlined and more and more popular. To a point that even right now we're in a literal gaming convention because of this. So oh, this is board games. Board games are popular. Yeah, I think it's board games. Just, we don't play D&D with a board. Uh, well, yes, I wouldn't call it a board game. It's a mat, it's a mat game? A mat game. Mm -hmm. It's a mat game? Well, yeah, so there's a correlation to it. At 5th edition, this is what we work with currently. And from my understanding at this point, 5th edition is the most popular Dungeons and Dragons game. Highest selling of all. Highest selling of all. Well, I'm gonna, like, it has less, far less stuff than 3.5 did. Like, if you're talking about units sold, 3.5 will still eclipse it because it had like 125 books, and I think 5th edition might be up to 15 at this point. Um, a, few more, a few more than that. But it certainly has, it certainly has, mm -hmm. like, captured beyond, beyond, like, basement nerd dwelling zeitgeist, right? And, and again, I mentioned Critical Role before, and I know Matt hates the term, but it's very real, like, the Versa effect is a thing. And so, I think with the rise of the ability to stream games, you could learn how to play it without needing to know a guy who knew a guy. That's the key. That's the key. Fifth edition is designed much simpler than all the other ones. Full disclosure, uh, I owe it to Critical Role that I and my friends that I've come yeah. back into the hobby. Uh, I was unemployed at the time and kind of down on my luck and was just like, yeah, I'm bored. I guess I'll see what this whole Critical Role thing is about. I've heard about Deep and Sundry. And, uh, I started watching and I was like, well, that's some interesting stuff. Oh, they came over from Pathfinder. Like, I played Pathfinder, but 
another adaptive into this new system that I didn't have any books for. And it was it, that was the onus for me to pick up D and D again. I talked to my friends, and I was like, "Hey, I can run a one shot, right?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, we play a one shot. Sure, why not?" And six years later, uh, we're still playing. So. <laughs> and I'm not pale about it. Then. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, um, fifth edition is when I got into just again just wasn't doing any role playing, and most of it's because of time constraints and making the character was going to take forever. And it wasn't until another uh, member of uh, Game of Game Presents, Rob, introduced me to it, and he's like, "Trust me, you can get this whole character done in like that." And he's right. The character design and the creation is quick. Yeah. In comparison to all the other ones. Twelve classes, very similar to three point five. Mm -hmm. uh, they added warlock, I believe. Yeah, warlock's the new one. Warlock was in the complete mage or whatever, complete arcane, so it was playable in 3.5, but they made it a mainline character book, or a mainline uh, class in the book uh, for 5th edition. Like charisma based answers. Yeah. yeah, that's also something that didn't really exist in 3.5. So in 3.5, your casting needed two um, stats to be good. Uh, there was how high of a level of spell could you cast, and then a separate stat controlled how powerful that was. Uh, they streamlined that down at, for 5th uh, edition, and it's just all based on one stat. Mm -hmm. So now you have things like, we don't have a fighter yet anymore, we literally just have a fighter. You don't have, uh, you have a fighter, you have a cleric, they're just clerical healing things, but now we can be whatever pathos they want to be. Druids are no longer subclassed as a, as a, uh, a to subclass with, uh, with clerics, now druid is its own thing. Rangers no longer is subclassed with the uh, fighters, they're their own thing. Artificers get added in later. Yeah. Uh, monks are back in and uh, are back in and not just in style, they work without breaking the system. Were, were monks in fourth? Were they in the fourth? I in a camp that once got added in like yeah, I, don't, later. Okay. I don't know if it's in the PHP. But it's not in the original. Yeah, so I know yeah, so the their third edition class in the player's handbook and then they, they think they disappear in fourth, but I could be wrong. I'm play Again, a I, in fourth edition, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've never played fourth edition. Um, but yeah, you had classes that could be designed very streamlined. So much, I think Critical Role has their own class. Yeah, and they have yeah, and they have their own uh, their own campaign setting and everything else that you can buy into. And now they have their own miniatures line, which I think came out last year. A bunch uh, of different subclasses yeah. in those books. Wizards. So the so Wizards two with fifth edition, right? You can't talk about the classes without also talking about the business model. Right. Because the business model, they went from 3.5, which was an open business model, to 4th, which was a very closed one, and it failed miserably. And so in order to get the, the public back into it, they had to open up. And so now it's not just, you know, in the early days of YouTube, you could probably find some really old D&D games where people talking about D&D. But now I could probably name 20 people whose job it is to talk about D&D or other role-playing games on YouTube. And they, yep. they make more money than I do, which is sad. Um, <laughs> so what I'm hearing is that there's a market for it. Why, why yeah, I so I actually, games? what's funny is I actually went to look for, I was like, there's all this 5th edition content. I wonder where the old, you know, 2010 YouTube 3rd uh, edition content is, and it's not there. Like. Not even, yeah, it, it might be a thing that we would have to start, we could start a channel talking about the old third edition content. Do, I, do, 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 I do know, so I, 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 I do, I also, so I advise the role playing club on Boise State's campus, and I've actually had some students who started fifth edition who are like, especially, this was like two or three years ago before the, the magic books started coming out, which is something I expected to happen in, nine, in 2000 when they were the same company, but it didn't. Speaking of businesses, that's a weird decision that it's taken us now to get magic and our D and D magic the gathering specifically. Uh, there's been magic and D. &D. Yeah, <laughs> like, like, just, just what is exactly the spells that you see. Yeah, so now, now we officially have in 2021. You got your you got D and D bleeding into magic and magic bleeding Maybe into D and D. Yeah, you got a D and D set for magic, and then you get the new commander set for Baldur's Gate that's about to drop. Sweet. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. And it's it's I can't be, I don't. I want to believe that game designers were smart enough in 2000 to say, hey, we should blend these. And I want to believe it was just somebody who was cranky who said no, who needed like an Oreo milkshake or something that day. And it was just like no one was afraid, everyone was afraid to ask after that. Because Magic has been an insanely popular game since 1993 when it was released. D&D is obviously the granddaddy of all role-playing games. Like it's dumb that they haven't gotten together before now. Um, but that's, you know, that's, 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 that's the thing. thing. More often than you think. Yeah, but I so I went back to look for that content. It's just not there. So so now might be the time. Yeah. But these kids got in, got into fifth edition when there were only maybe ten books out, and they were like, okay, well, we've kind of done this thing. And I was like, hey, kids, you want to buy a watch? <laughs> <laughs> like, 
you want to you want to try third edition? <laughs> yeah, and and one of one of the students, her name's McKenna. She came over and we built characters and stuff. And she's like, "You didn't? Did you just trick me into doing more math?" <laughs> and I was like, "No, not on purpose." Uh, but some of them have left fifth edition and come to three five because of its because of that nature. But I love I love fifth edition for that. I played very little. I'm actually about to start um, probably my first regular fifth edition campaign soon. Um, but I love how approachable it is. And then you can you can take people to older editions. Um, there are people who still play the second and third editions of Warhammer 40,000. Those disappeared in the 80s. And so uh, that's colloquially referred to as Old Hammer, although that's an ageist term, and I would never use it except to the people directly I'm making fun of who still play it. Um, the, but there are people who are still interested. I know I know a gaming group that still plays first ed, D&D. Yep. &D. That's, that's all they'll ever play. They're out there. Um, and, and there are YouTubers who talk about first and second ed, but third is, is kind of that hole that's missing, which is weird because they're so confident. So you heard it here, folks. We're debuting our new TBD. 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 Uh -huh. um, man, if they if I had to for every time another podcast that comes up. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, here we go. Yeah. Uh, one thing I think that makes fifth edition a little bit more approachable, made fourth edition a little bit more approachable, is the fact that they don't have so many books. There aren't so many, uh, the numbers don't get as high. And that is very much so intentional. In, in 3.5, it's a, a hallmark of the system that you can get, you know, plus 30, plus... You can get three. So, yeah, so right now, uh, Cheyenne's AC in, in our Every Other Week Sunday game is like 28. Yeah, and that's not, that's not a normal. No. The other thing, the other flip side of that is like everybody else in the party has a pretty decent chance of hitting it. Absolutely. So it's it's not weird to when you can stack on all these magical bonuses and things that apply to get a especially when you have a, tw a twenty sided die roll to go with it to get a plus thirty you know a 35, 40 to hit. Um, when you're above twelfth and thirteenth level, it's common to say like, does a forty hit? And and then you kind of have to go like, yeah. Which, which is wild to me. In 5th yeah. edition, the highest DC that they have in the book, and that doesn't mean your DCs can't go beyond that, but in the book, rules is written, the highest DC they've got is 30. And that is like, ungodly uh, to hit. So, yeah, yeah. yeah they, they definitely were like, hey, what if we did all the same effects, but we just lowered the math? <laughs> <And> <laughs> which I'm, I'm all for. Yeah, right? I was going to say, ADHD kids everywhere were like, thank God. Not only for the graph paper, like, I don't know what I'm hitting now. Yeah. Uh, I played. I, I played. So for us. <laughs> no, uh, I, I did recently, even recently play D, played some three five with a guy who who brought a calculator yeah. to yeah. calculate his damage because no he shame. couldn't keep all the dice uh, totaled in his head. No shame. Yeah. Uh, so fifth edition is kind of the. Didn't do the he didn't use his phone as a calculator. Oh sure. He brought a TI eighty four. The, 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 the little yeah, not the eighty four, not the big one. He brought uh, a, a TI thirty. Okay. Yeah. It's not graphing it out. No. Gotcha. Not, it's not. You don't need parabolas. I mean, you might. Uh, so fifth edition is kind of the streamlined, I don't want to say version of 3.5 because I feel like it's kind of reductions to both versions, but uh, they definitely learn from fourth edition, the simplicity of fourth edition, uh, and the complexity of 3.5, and they've kind of landed on fifth edition. Additionally, just as a quick aside, I know uh, that additionally. Uh, uh, we are looking at kind of the next iteration of D&D is coming up. I don't think it's sixth edition. They haven't said that it is sixth edition, but it is uh, a new rule set that is functional with 5th edition. Uh, they've said that every book you buy from now until that edition is released in 2024, hypothetically, uh, will be able to be used in this new edition. A lot of people are calling it 5.5, a lot of people are like, oh, it's not 6th edition, but it's using the 5th edition rule set, which I don't, I don't know what the difference is at that point, I guess. Um, so that should be interesting to see. Yeah, and we're on the cusp of yeah. maybe another three five. I, I I would think, and I would hope. Um, Point seven five. Yeah. Five point five. So, so again, I I've drawn a lot of comparisons between Wizards of the Coast and Games Workshop, who publishes forty k. But they came out and said eighth edition was going to be a living edition, and that was the last edition they were going to do. And then two years later, dropped ninth. Sure. So I don't trust these publishers as far as I can throw them. Which Wizards, if you've never seen the Wizards headquarters, it's pretty decent size. You can't throw it very far. Um, the, even with a net, even with a net twenty, um, but I would I would think for a game like this, if you look back to how fast and like just how insanely all the time the three five content came out, they've done a really good job with fifth of slowing that down. I, I would think if I were them, what I would do is maybe maybe do a, a five point one and, sure. and and just call it that and just do some rules fixes, um, especially considering. 
And again, this is an outside company, but the success of things like taking 20, Critical Role, um, I forget what the a DD, uh, what's Brent, Brennan Lee Mulligan's Dimension 20. Dimension 20. Um, those, if they want those, those kind of outsiders to continue to drive sales, which they do, um, then, then I would say like you need to keep the changes as minimal as possible. And you could you could continue you could release four thousand fifth edition books between now and I don't know twenty thirty or twenty fifty or whatever, and never change the base edition. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I said, three fine. three five three, in eight years three five put out fifty classes. There's no reason fifth edition can't do that much much slower. Yeah. Um, and continue to give you like all the spice of life. Sure. And considering all the cross licensing that Wizards is doing for Magic, there's about to be and I. Again, I should probably stop talking about Warhammer, but there's about to be a Warhammer Commander set in Magic the Gathering. They're calling it like Worlds Beyond or whatever. There's no reason, since it's the same company, that you can't get some of those licensings over on the 5th edition thing. Like, I know Games Workshop's all about publishing its own role-playing book, but there's no reason they can't partner with Wizards to do, like, here's your 40k role-playing for 5th edition rules. Like, and bring back this D20 system rule and let Sword and Sorcery come back. And that's, if, if I were Wizards, I wouldn't be looking at a new edition of D&D ever. I'd be looking at spot fixes and more content for this one. Yeah. New campaign settings. I know that uh, Magic's looking at a Lord of the Rings set as well. Yep, it's, so. it's not just looking at, like, some cards have been linked from is coming next year. It's the summer set for so next year. We might get Balrogs back, y'all. We could, yeah. Like, oh, they made love. Uh, they made, they made they love. I think the Tolkien estate is now, like, dangerously looking at Amazon, being like, please don't screw this up. Because <laughs> everybody's, everybody's pretty sure they're going to screw this up. Oh. So, yeah, oh God. so, this is where we get to more of. Where it is, again, it's like this. There is countless shows out there that now have episodes dedicated to Dungeons and Dragons. Um, community has community has one. Uh, uh, they, there's at least two community episodes that deal with D and D. Yeah, two. Yeah, two. Um, and then they also have a regular show and almost uh, several, several different anime shows. Regular show and, and um, what is it? Gravity Falls have a Dungeons and Dragons episode. The first thing they ask is. They have to pick a character. I love some of their uh, of the characters in a uh, regular show because it made no sense. It's like apparently a cybernetic cowboy that you can play as, but you have to sleep for the first five turns. Uh, there's, got one. Uh, oh, yeah. there's a, there's a, and then there are shows that like animate. I mean, right, beyond Vox Machina, right? There's yeah. there's the Harmon Quest, which is an animated show about the D and D game they play. Uh, did you have? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Part did, aren't they bringing a new? So I know they did. Allegedly. Yeah, Allegedly. they're bringing. So this is this is also the new like nostalgia they're cashing cashing in, right? Like obviously the X Men cartoon is getting a new a season. I I heard that the D and D series is getting a new season. Like they're just gonna pick up where they left off with that cartoon that and true. do a new season. I don't recall. Did they ever make it this this completely off base? Did they ever make it home? No, I don't no. think so. I don't. I don't yeah. remember them ever making it home. Last I remember. Dave the Red Dragon. I think so. Yeah. yeah. And I think it was the TK, TPK. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right. So there was supposed to be a extra script that was written out and voice acted, but they never got the animation because the show got canceled by that point in time. It's a lost. It's considered a lost episode. But yeah, in the seri- uh, it would have been one of the big. If they made it, it would have been a big game changer in how animation in the eighties would work out because it would basically get very metaphysical, which is unseen in, in 80s cartoons, because the end of it would be that it was a total party wipe. The kids died at the end. Damn. Did they die? This was supposed to be a kids movie. My, yeah, on, on, on the subject of <coughs> show stuff, and so yeah. the record of Lotus War being Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Record of Lotus War is also an anime based entirely on Dungeons and Dragons. Hammerfall, the band, is almost entirely inspired by Dungeons and Dragons. Throw around Hammerfall is? Really? Yeah, and yeah. the band is uh, inspired. I mean, if you're a rock at any property, you'll probably find a Dungeons and Dragons correlation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, especially Stranger Things is popular. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. yeah, they even have their own Stranger Things campaign, which yeah. I've seen the book. It's limited, which, but which is it works. difficult for me because it's like, oh, this is the Displacer Beast. I'm like, that's not a Displacer Beast, but <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah, but yeah, big. Big Bang Theory is one of those one of those shows that's like, hey, what if we took every single fandom and put it in a blender and see what it spits out this week? So, it, I, another one I, I don't remember, I, and I haven't seen the final like three seasons, but I know there's a couple of LARP episodes for Supernatural. Do they ever talk about? Oh, they're so good. I know they reference D and D a couple of times because D makes fun of Sam, but like, yeah, yeah. And she, I mean, the, 
Kevin, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, right? And right. then you've got Felicia Day, who's in Supernatural episodes, the LARP episodes. She made the guild, the guild based largely off of World of Warcraft, but also off yeah. of tropes from Dungeons and Dragons. Well, World of Warcraft is based off oh, well, largely yeah. tropes from Dungeons and Dragons. Which is based off of Lord of the Rings, which, which is, is based, based off of. <laughs> so Thomas Mallory would like to speak to all of you. Felicia Day will be a fan of. Yay! Yeah. She's so lovely. Uh, but yeah, I think that, I think that, like, so I was, I was at my job at Boise State, I spend a lot of time on the computer, and not all of it is doing work, don't tell anyone. Um, and uh, I came across uh, a brand new YouTuber, this is like a year and a half ago, named Ginny D, and some of you might know who she is, she's sponsored by Wizards now. And, and on, in her first episode, where she was sponsored by Wizards, I got irrationally angry. And I understand that this was irrationally angry, but I was like, who is this kid who has been playing my game for like a week, and suddenly Wizards is like, hey, kid, we're gonna partner with you. What I wanna know, Watsy, is where were you when I was standing by that creek? Throwing, no, Wizards didn't come save me. Uh, I had to save myself, I guess. Uh, when there was one set of footprints, that's, that's, when, Wizard, you. that's when Wizards carried me, well, maybe. Um, but what, it, what, it, what I finally realized is when I got over being like, who is this kid who's suddenly famous for, for doing this thing that I've been doing my whole life and I've never once been you know, recognized by Wizards for, is I realized that its position in the zeitgeist has shifted so far from thing that was demonized in the 70s and 80s to things only nerds did in the 90s and if you were a nerd you weren't cool, to the mid-2000s where, where fandom and really the MCU might be the most to blame for this, um, but where fandoms were suddenly okay for everyone. Halo, Halo and Halo and the MCU are like, f suddenly video games were cool and everyone could play them, and uh, big movie stars were in comic book stuff and it was suddenly okay to read comics at the lunch table. Um, but while I was getting my ass kicked by uh, the jocks at my school for playing magic at the nerd table, that's something that this kid will never have to go through. Uh, just because of how uh, we the, the society kind of looks at these games now. And you, you might point at Harry Potter and some of those other, uh, I mean, certainly the Lord of the Rings movies made Tolkien more popular than he ever would have been in the book. Star Wars, um, which also, by the way, has a 3.5 rule set. Um, you're welcome. Uh, it's things that, like, they're never going to have to do those things, right? And it's, and it's largely, largely due to the changes made for 5th edition. Made it more accessible, made it so that anybody could play, made it so that any, and again, the internet made it so that you didn't have to know a guy. So, like, how did, how did you get into D&D? &D? Uh, I heard it through a friend. Okay. Mm -hmm. You okay? You okay? Yep. Uh, from Dane, actually. Okay. <laughs> when, how did you start playing D&D? &D? Oh, middle school. Okay. Knew a guy who knew a guy? Me? Yeah, Eddie. Oh, uh, I think I started playing around... 19 when a coworker of mine from Domino's was okay. like, hey, play 3.5 with me. And I'm like, what's 3.5? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Didn't even call it Dungeons and Dragons because he didn't want to be looked at. Funny, you just said play 3.5 uh, with me. Probably, yeah. Uh, I was the kids I was a boy scout. Okay. In, did you start playing it first? Uh, no, second. Second. Okay. Heck yeah. I haven't played yet. Oh. Oh, heck yeah. I'm Let's, go. Let's do it. Let's do it. First of all, excellent shirt. <laughs> also a game you've probably never actually played. It's available as a browser game. Oh, hey, oh, I, I forget. Pardon me. I, I'm sorry. I forgot emulators exist. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Grandpa. We don't have the floppy disks for them anymore, okay? But, uh, I, middle school, high school, 3.5 off and on. Okay. I'm actually uh, trying to get into a group goal for Earth Dawn. Okay. Oh, yeah. So, the, the thing that Fit did, so everybody in here kind of got into it where someone invited them. The thing that Fit did meant that that didn't have to happen anymore. A group of, a group of people could get together and decide, I want to try this thing I saw on Stranger Things, or I saw on Supernatural, or I yep. saw on Gravity Falls, or whatever, and they could buy the player's handbook, and, and maybe even a Dungeon Master's Guide, and get on the internet, and it would teach them how to play. And so they never had to go through these, like, dark alley, like, need to know the password, like, somebody, like, you know, in your mom's basement with the dead ale wives playing, uh, <laughs> where you have to bring the Mountain Dews and the Doritos yourselves, or the Cheetos yourselves. They don't have to, Ginny didn't have to go through that, right? She could just... She could just, yeah, and again, thankfully, right, she could just show up at a game store or anywhere else, and, and while, especially, uh, 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 especially young women who try to get into D&D, &D, there's still stigma there, she probably felt that a little bit, um, 
but she didn't have to be like harassed at her lunch table for doing this thing because of shows like Dimension 20 and Credit Rule. Like they're huge. There's TV shows of, like and cartoons based on them now, and not not the terrible one from the 80s, but like a really good animation with professional with a budget. Like, yeah, with a budget. <laughs> and and so like I had to get over myself for a second, being like, where were you when I needed you? But I'm just glad that it never went away because yeah. there was a time. Before, third, before Wizards bought TSR, where we might only have two editions of D&D, and the last book you might have gotten was in 1989. Yep. So. Well, and hell, I mean, you, I, I think one thing that I really like to, to point to is the show Freaks and Geeks, which, yeah. even though it was released... What a great show. It's such a great show. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It's, it's a little old. It's dated set in the 80s? Yes, uh, I think it's in the 80s. Okay. Yeah, I think like yeah. 1980 specifically. 1980s. Yeah. Fred Savage is in it as a young man. Amazing. Uh, it's where it's like a lot of like Linda Cardellini got her start in that uh-huh. show. Yeah, a lot of a lot of actors and actresses. Sean uh, Francis started. Daly, mm-hmm. huge mm-hmm. D and D nerd, got a start. Uh, but in, in this show. episode specifically, there is a character who is kind of a burnout, uh, and it's not part of the nerd crew. It's a bit more popular with people, uh, and they invite him to play, and they, they actually show him sitting down and creating his character and letting himself go. Uh, and I know this, this is about classes, but it's still about Dungeons and Dragons, so I, I, I feel like it's applicable here. D&D and tabletop role-playing games at this day and age is just for everybody. And I think that's pretty freaking rad. Yeah. You know, the fact that Joe Manganiello has been in the game for a long time, but is now kind of publicly showing that side of himself is a huge change, I think. You know, someone who's seen as traditionally attractive, traditionally successful, uh, you know, this big, hunky uh, actor can nerd out about Tiamat and about a drawing he got from the creator of Dragonlance that his wife got for him for his birthday. Like, I mean, that's just, there's something so wholesome about loving what you do and loving what you're into unabashedly. So Freaks and Geeks came out in 99. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And then uh, Vin Diesel and the crew of Fast and Furious, which came out in 01, so they were filming in 2000, have been playing the same D&D game on the set of every Fast and Furious movie they've ever made. Uh, he and, and some crew members, and um, Paul Walker played in that game a little bit, but it wasn't really his thing, play the same game. So for nine and a half movies now in, you know, 21 years, they've been playing the same campaign. Do you think that's where the uh, beef between The Rock and Vin Diesel comes from? You know what? It, it, Vin Diesel you, killed his character. You heard it here first, you heard it here first folks. The, <laughs> the split in the Fast Fam, uh, it was actually Tyrese. Ah. Tyrese uh, is who killed The Rock's character in a misguided PvP moment, um, and and that is what broke up the Fast family. And now The Rock only plays uh, Pathfinder Second Edition with Jason Statham. Makes sense. Yeah, Makes sense. yeah, that's. that's it. I, I would that say, uh, I suppose before we go for closing, yeah, yeah. Uh, if you're interested in D and D, if you're interested in tabletop role playing games, there are a lot of great systems out there. D and D is not the only one, nor is it always the best for what you want to do. I would definitely say if you have an interest in tabletop role-playing games, or even just trying this weird thing that we all do on occasion, that some of us do on occasion, where we gather around a table and tell a story communally, go for it. Yeah, there's tons of other systems out there. Yeah. Like my bread and butter has been Cortex for the longest. Love Cortex. Cortex is great. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vampire the Masquerade. If you're in the more horror mood, or, or any of the World of Darkness oh, books, yeah. uh, if you're looking for something spooky, uh, or Dread. Uh, I had uh, actually. My friend Moss ran a dread game for me, and it was incredible. Uh, you use a Jenga tower instead of dice. Like, it's the craziest thing, you just pull on Jenga tiles. But uh, I'd definitely say if you're interested or even curious about both tabletop role-playing games, D&D, or any of the above, check it out. Go do it. It's it's changed my life. I think it's changed probably yeah. most of our lives here. Um, highly recommend. So if we have, before we close out, I want to get some special, like, weird thing that you know that's related to Dungeons and Dragons classes. One thing that I found that was weird and hilarious is um, there's been a lot of people who would shout out at priests uh, in the Middle Ages, like if you're doing historical uh, writings for that, or doing any kind of historical lookup, that will always draw them like in pictures with like maces and such, and that totally has to do with Dungeons and Dragons because players can't equip blades or can't equip it. It'll equip uh, maces, so I always thought that was hilarious. Uh, not not about D and D, but there's there's a, a really really famous live action role play game that's been going on a long time called Darkon, and they have that same restriction. Their cleric class can't use bladed weapons. Um, let's see the weirdest the weirdest D and D thing I know for class related. Um, class related, yeah. Because that's the weirdest one I know of watching people like explain to you about the Crusades and 
there's always a cleric with a mace for some reason, and that's there's no physical reason why you can't just pick that up. God won't let you. Yeah, I won't let you. I think for me, uh, it, it's maybe not a weird quirky thing, but it's something I've always found interesting. Is, is kind of the differences and similarities between an Orthodox monk and a more Eastern monk. Uh, you know, there are some people who will allow monk to class in the game as long as you are playing in an Orthodox or Eastern, uh, sorry, Western fashion, uh, which is a little bit odd to me because I don't know why a friar tuck is punching somebody, but I mean, <laughs> you could do it. Um, but I do find it interesting, so my background historically is in Eastern history, and uh, I think it's interesting this idea of including, not stereotypically, hopefully, but including these warrior monks, uh, which did historically exist uh, in, in the Eastern parts of our world, I think is fascinating. I think it's a great addition, in my opinion, to most role-playing games, because it is such a different flavor. I mean, samurai, you can kind of dilute down to a warrior. Uh, obviously, historically, there are much much difference between like samurais and knights or what have you, but uh, campaign-wise, play-wise, you know, fighter is the base class that samurai is under in fifth edition, as an example. And so you could make the argument that a battle master fighter and a samurai aren't that different, other than in some of the specialized things they do, right? Uh, but I think it's very interesting the idea that like uh, of this warrior monk. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes from history is that. Uh, Oda Nobunaga, one of the famous warlords from Japan, he attacked monasteries, and it was always difficult, but it was worth it to him because they had the gold. So not only were these fighting monks you know, out and around at this time, they also had the money. <laughs> ah, and that's, they are the bearers of this planet. Yeah, so one day I hope to play a, a, a monk with just a bunch of money. Money monk? Yeah. Money. Uh, so the, the thing I thought of, uh, I had to look up for sure when the Halfling's Gem came out, 1990. Yeah. Um, so, second edition rules. Uh, I do know that so, the Halfling's Gem is the first book in the Trent Stewart, and there's a Trent statue down the hall. Um, if you haven't read... It's the third edition. Is it? Yeah, Crystal Shirt's the first one. Oh, when did Shirt... Okay, so I, I got them out of order. When uh, when did Crystal Shirt come out? It's so, okay. So, still still second edition. Yeah, yeah so, no, okay. still the second okay. edition. Uh, I just love those books, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. so 1st edition, because 2nd edition is 89. I'm good with it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, it's, it, it, the, the exact edition is kind of irrelevant to the story, because it's funny. Um, but Dritz started his life as an actual character someone was playing, and the tabletop version of Dritz is historically and, and anecdotally much worse than his book version. And uh, famously, uh, Bob Salvatore's Dritz got killed six or seven times in the first game that he was playing. But because, um, and I want to say it was Greenwood's game, uh, Greenwood knew he was using this character's inspiration for a novel series that, that had kind of already been agreed upon. He f uh, faked, rule, like, faked roles. Greenwood like gave Bob Salvatore preference at the table to not get his character killed because his character couldn't hack what he would need to do in a novel. And so both of them are on record saying that, yeah, Ari Salvatore got a lot of preferential treatment in those early uh, Theron games because he was writing a book based on this character. Chris Short came out in 88. 88. Uh, there's no way he didn't know about second edition. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. guarantee Okay. Um, um, kind of to go along with that, actually. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the 3-5 the version of Trace is actually tabletop survival. You can actually get, in the, in the player's guide to Theron, you can actually get his stats, and they're kind of silly. Um, but yeah, definitely not as survivable as like the the book version. He multiclasses way more than I thought he would. Yeah. Yeah, he's got four classes. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, so, little known fun fact about D and D's. Ed Greenwood, uh, not just D and D, but Forgotten Realms specifically. Uh, Ed Greenwood is the, the progenitor of the Forgotten Realms, and to this day, unless they've amended the contract that they had with him when they bought his share in his own world, uh, everything he says and types. In, a, in regards to Forgotten Realms is canon. Oh, yeah, well, that, that doesn't make sense. Which is crazy when yeah. you think about it. Can you imagine signing, like, being Wizards of the Coast, signing that contract, being like, yeah, you can say whatever you want, it's canon. Yeah, I, they can ignore it. Yeah. They can absolutely and ignore not it, it but, <laughs> but he's just like, yeah, the sky's purple. And he's like, yeah, okay, sky and Forgotten Realms is purple now. I guess that's, I guess that's gonna happen. That's just that's the way funny. it goes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't know of anyone else who's sold their IP that has anywhere near that kind of creative control. Like, no, George Lucas no. certainly doesn't. No, uh, 
Yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah. It's, it's wild to me. Like, I don't know if it's still the case, but it was at one point the yeah. case. Um, yeah. Also, I think it's safe to say, and I'm going to make a sweeping generalization, which I know to be true, and there's no way this could be false. Everyone's first character is a Dark Elf Ranger. It's just the way it goes. It's just the way it goes. With a sad backstory. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. And, yeah. Although mine was a Wood Elf Ranger, totally different. Used two scimitars, definitely not inspired. I, my first two characters were both uh, uh, Dwarf Rogues. Dark Elf Rangers. Dwarf Rogues. Dark Elf Rangers. I've never played a Dark Elf, uh, Dark Elf Ranger. I have played a Dark Elf Ninja. I don't believe you. And, uh, and David in the front DM'd that game, and uh, Bobby and I made that a nightmare. Whenever I play a human character, my first instinct is to say that's the part I was born to play. <laughs> my second instinct is to always make a pun name. I think I actually ran a cleric whose name is Huge Man. Ah. There you are. There you are. I suppose really quick, does anyone have any questions? Yeah, we have time for one Anybody got anything they want to add? What was your first character? What was your first character? Dark Elf Ranger. Uh, was it? You a wizard. Okay. I heard Dark Elf I heard someone wanted to be Mordecai and it was Magic Hood. Yeah. Uh, Tiefling Rogue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Tieflings. So Tieflings have very much replaced. I think the Dark Elves is everyone's first go-to kind of edge lordy characters. Yeah. yeah. They're so purple. Yeah, and also I don't care what Wizard says. They say that Tieflings can only be red, shades of red. That's wrong. Purple's a shade of red. I mean, not. It's the very blue shade of red. You can have, if you want a blue Tiefling, done. That's a shade of red with no red in it. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. A white Tiefling, yeah. sure. Whatever. Shade whatever, go, okay, be whatever tiefling you want to be. Be the tiefling you want to see in the world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's your first character? Half of the. Nice. Yeah, see? Dwarf. Dwarf? Dwarf what? Just dwarf. Just dwarf. dwarf. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Battle oh, Rises for classics. Nice. Okay. Uh, half elf rogue. Okay. Yep. Feeling it? Yep. I don't remember. I played version one. Okay. Oh. oh. Nice. Yes. And then I was never allowed to play again until I met my husband. There you go. He okay. sent me back in. But now we play with our kids. We have seven kids together. We That's a whole party right there. We play with our kids, and then if you date, we have seven girls, or six girls, one boy. If you date one of our kids, you have to play D&D, or you're not welcome in our family. I love this. I love this. I love this. That has a, you know, I've, I've never really understood the, the shotgun dad energy. Because it was always like, you know, kids are going to be kids, but I like I like D&D mom yeah, energy. Like, yeah. maybe, maybe not shotgun, but like longsword? Yeah, 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 there we go. Like, well, you have to sit down and play. For, for us, our adventures as a family happen in the D&D world. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like, we don't say, remember that time when we played that game? Yeah. The yeah. character did that? It's like, remember when you did this? Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. So I love that. we have, like, all these memories as a family. Our kids are grown and gone now. But they come home every other Sunday to play the to play nice. and have dinner. So I love this. we're getting the grandkids in. There we yes. go. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> Keeping the dream alive. Yeah, talk yeah. about that uh, shotgun uh, that energy. Um, we have it on record at Nibble Star for Steve, who oh, actually yeah. um, he's like, if you're gonna date my children, you better be able to play Castlevania. <laughs> there we go. Old okay. school. There we go. Okay, okay. What was your first character? Okay. Well, I'm feeling a lot of half elves in the, in the room. What do you want your first character to be? Dark Elf Ranger. Just make Dane stick. No, it's okay. You don't have to. Make Dane stick. What is it? Go tight. Okay. Go to work. Well, you, honey. 14. 14. Good time to play Dane. It's not a never a bad time, but it's a good time. My first character is Dwarf Monk. Dwarf Monk. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Was first killed off, he actually had the spike armor and he liked to uh, do a bullet ball attack. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, he had some simple, simple point of energy. Yeah. Uh, also, yeah. this is a random thought that came to me and I'm just going to throw it out there. Aren't all of Gary Gygax's games over? Uh, yes, yes, by definition. Cool. Yeah. 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 And if you're wondering what ours were, mine was Human Fighter because I'm sticking with the classic. <laughs> Mine was absolutely a Wood Elf Ranger, and I had two scimitars and a wolf companion. Yes. Totally different! Yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember Halfling Claire. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what, a great, what a great way to go. Uh, specifically, mine was a, uh, a female, because uh, I was just a dorky kid who liked chicks and hot and liked chainmail bikinis. Uh, half elf rogue who wore like not a lot of clothing and also painted herself like a tiger. Like, there's, again, I mentioned very, very early, I mentioned very, very early that small children are not rational. And I had a big thing for Chitaro. 
uh, as a small boy, uh, and so I wanted to make a character that was close to that, but wasn't that, so my friends wouldn't recognize that's tra what I was trying to do. So I like, the serial yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I was uh, totally uh, uh, right. Uh, yeah. uh, she she did, not, she did not she did not last here. she did not last long. Um, first of all, remarkably, an eight year old boy cannot accurately portray an adult female, especially when other adult females are around listening to you play them especially if you kind of have a thing for the character you've made in your own head. So I was very quickly not allowed to, I was like, you're going to play boys only for the rest of your career. And I've stuck with that outside of DNA. I, I'm retroactively cringing for eight-year-old you. Yeah, uh, eight-year-old me didn't know enough to cringe. Yeah. I, I didn't start cringing about that till I was like 26. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> till I got over my Lamborghini phase, a car I will never own. <laughs> All right. So that is our episode of the podcast. Assuming I did the recording right, this will be on YouTube for it, uh, to be displayed, but also I'll be placing it to the normal podcast world rotation. Um, thanks to you, everybody, for checking out Game Theater Podcast. We're on, at this point, almost every, there's just a few podcatchers that we are not on. There's some past episodes that you might want to check out. And honestly, thanks for joining in. Thanks, everybody. This is Geek Scorpio. This is Geek Scorpio. I'm Dane. Oh, I know my D and Dane on the internet. Uh, I'm Dane. Uh, you can find my Instagram at, at @masterdaily. Yep. And with all that being said, this is Gaming Theater Podcast. Logging out. Thank See you all. Catch your book. <laughs>